Good morning and uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to today's webinar on the Overcoming Medicare Cost Report Issues. Uh, this session is being sponsored today by the Tennessee HFMA and co-sponsored by the Alabama and Georgia HFMA chapters. I'm Martha Calfee, the Tennessee HFMA President-Elect, and we'd like to thank you for your attendance today. Um, today's uh, topic is being led by Debbie Scott, who is the Audit Manager with Cahaba, and she and Karen McGrath uh, are also, um, is also on the line, so we will um, give that to them. Uh, the CPE credit, uh, you will need to answer two-thirds of the polling questions that are uh, done today, and you will also need to be in attendance for at least 90% of the session in order to get your CPE credit. Um, the CPE certificates will be issued around the end of November. Um, without taking up any additional time, I'm going to uh, turn the session over um, to Debbie. And if you have questions during the session, just type those in your chat box and we will get those answered for you. Debbie? Hello, um, this is Debbie Scott and I'm with Cahaba Government Benefit Administrator with um, Provider Audit and Reimbursement. And I'm glad to be here today to go over cost reporting with you and issues that we may have had um, while filing your cost reports. So today we're going to talk about the cost report receipt and tips for filing your cost report, amended cost reports, reopening issues, PSNR information, bad debts for Medicare cost reports, various cost report issues, rack adjustments for PIP providers, the 2016 hospital wage index and OMS review, and then we will have time for questions. As noted, I'm Debbie Scott, and I've given you my contact information in above with my email address, phone number, and fax number. If you have some questions, please feel free to contact me, and I will also be giving you other addresses for maybe more specific payment questions, that type of issues. I wanted to show you on our website, we have a lot of information, and you go under Claims to provide our audit and reimbursement. And as you can see from the screenshot, we have um, various information about the audit process, due dates, filing cost reports, forms and instructions, mailing instructions. Um, it keeps going down the line. There's reopenings, admitted cost reports. So um, we also bring in new things that they're updated. If CMS gives us new things containing uh, cost report information, we will place it here, and uh, this is always a good place to start if you have questions. So we're going to go over some cost report information. Uh, cost reports receipts, you can look on our website at the following link, and if you want to follow up on a receipt, acceptance, or settlement of your Medicare cost report, please send that email to CRINQAL at Cahaba gba.com and they should be able to answer your questions. As you are aware, the 630 providers are getting ready to file their cost reports that are due um, 1130 this month and um, wanted to give you some tips on filing those cost reports. All cost reports are required to be filed electronically um, with the exception of that cost report certification page, we still have to have an original signed cost report worksheet S page. And uh, copies of that, scan documents, email documents cannot be accepted. Certification page. If you owe money to the program, please check, a t please, please place your check at the top of the package. It's applicable. And also note on there uh, your CCN number or um, identifying information because sometimes um, we have trouble matching those checks with the cost report uh, because they are pulled out for deposit. 
before you file your cost report, you need to go into the PSNR system and obtain your PSNR about within 30 days of the due date of the cost report. Um, you'll get a reminder letter for any changes in your filing requ requirements. You will, um, you should include a cover letter with your cost report, including a phone number. So if we have any problems opening your electronic media or with your information, we can contact someone. If you have password protected that, uh, do not include the password in the package. You can either send a separate package with that password, once again, ensuring that you're identifying your provider um, name and number, or you can send that password via our email address and, and ensure that you have properly identified the provider that it relates to. Please ensure that all your contact information, including the name, address, and telephone numbers are current, and that letters are sent, um, be aware that our letters are sent based on the contacts in the STAR system. So if you're receiving information that is addressed to John Smith and he left 10 years ago, the reason that you're still receiving that is you need to update your 855A with provider enrollment to get the most um, up-to-date contact information in there. If you do have problems with your software as you are filing your cost report, please be aware that we cannot assist you with those and please contact your software vendor for help with those issues. If you're um, wanting to know who some vendors are, maybe maybe you new to the program, maybe you're um, changing vendors or considering changing vendors, there's a list of those <clears throat> excuse me, those approved vendors on our website. And I have given the link in our presentation. Just to give you some idea of the timing of when these uh, cost reports are due and um, how long it will take. Once we receive your cost report, we have 30 days from the receipt of the cost report to determine if we can accept it or reject it. Once it's determined that it's accepted, we have 60 days to issue a tentative settlement. Uh, the, the exception to this would be providers who are tying out do not uh, require a tentative settlement. As a general rule, 12 months from acceptance, um, we issue the final NPR. Hospitals with DISH are still on hold, or you may be held for audit. Um, Right now, we are in about an 18-month cycle due to some workload changes from CMS. And um, so if you've got a 1231-12 cost report and you haven't received your adjustments, you'll most likely be receiving those in the next few weeks. If you are selected for audit, um, you will have four to six weeks to provide documentation before we uh, schedule the insurance conference. And we will contact you prior to that to ensure that we have the date set up for all of us to be able to work together. We receive a lot of amended cost reports. Those amended cost reports are required by us to be accepted or rejected within 30 days. You still have to file electronically. And we will maybe issue a tentative settlement amended within 60 days. So we make that determination. Admitted cost reports are generally accepted by the audit managers and usually only if the desk review process has not been started. If the cost report has not been scoped, we'll consider um, accepting those. There are times where, where maybe we haven't accepted due to issues that may not have been determined by CMS um, or issues that we are in disagreement about. Um, sometimes uh, if we can accept it, we might consider those bad debt listings or new dish listings if we're not too far into our process um, for further review. So if you have an issue and it's not accepted, you can uh, we can let you know where we are in the process and if we still have time to maybe consider those items or not. If we do not accept that amended cost report, um, once we finalize the cost report, you have three years to reopen and you can request reopening 
opening to incorporate those as minted items if they are greater than $10,000. We do suggest that if you're sending an amended cost report or amended items, that those are sent within eight months from your physical year end, about three months after your cost report is filed, just to ensure that um, we have not started the process. So, you know, the later it goes into the process, the less likely that you will receive uh, that your amended cost report will be accepted. We have noted some issues with providers filing amended cost reports for the dish calculation related to the Alina case. That issue has not been addressed by CMS and we've not been given approval to follow that decision. Um, last I heard, CMS may still appeal to the Supreme Court and so those amended cost reports are not being accepted. Before I go on to the reopening policy, I would like to um, go with our first polling question. Martha or Brad, are you going to be able to? Okay, we've got just a, um, we'll close this one and share. And Debbie, it looks like there's a mix. Okay, did you get, uh, do you have me back? Yes. Okay. So that sounds good. Okay, so we're going to go on to um, the next part of the presentation, which is reopening policy. As noted previously, CAHAVA requires a $10,000 reimbursement impact in order to grant a reopening request. That threshold applies to each provider individually and not chain provider cost reports, which total $10,000 or greater in aggregate. Providers should always send a formal request letter with the reimbursement impact of your reopening. Our reopening process is paperless. Therefore, we do encourage you to send your reopening request to the email at reopenings at cahabagba.com and that is an inbox with electronic documents to ensure a more efficient reopening process. If you have those password protected, as, as we do lots of times when we're sending PHI related to bad debts and DISH, please send any password for the supporting documents with another email so we can include it in our electronic work paper process. And um, we want to make sure that you understand that you need to submit all supporting documentation with your reopening request or the reopening may be denied. Um, if you request to submit a certain document there on the side of too much rather than not enough to support your reopening. And if a consultant is submitting a reopening request for you, the provider should include a letter stating that we may deal with the consultant on your provider's behalf, and you should send only one reopening request, not one from, from the consultant and one from the provider. As noted previously, please make sure all correspondence has your CCN number and your um, provider name on that information and the FYE particularly in a reopening issue that it is related to. 
once you send that reopening request, if you have a lot of large attachments in particular, please follow up with an email to the reopening at Cahaba GBA mailbox. If you don't receive a notice of reopening letter within a few weeks, um, we have had problems sometimes with the uh, email system security flagging those as junk mail and not releasing them or notifying us that they've come in. So we want to, you want to err on the side of caution and, and notify us if, if you've sent something and haven't heard from us. Do not send a check with your reopening request. Um, you know, when we process your reopening, we may or may not grant it, number one, and we may not come to the same conclusion that you have come to. So if you're showing that you owe $20,000, we can process that there might be uh, changes in the system or we might have a disagreement in days or the bad debts, and, and it may be that we would say that you owed uh, $15,000 instead. So uh, until that reopening request is processed, we don't have a way to apply it. So please do not send a check with those. Um, which lets you know if, you, if you've been denied, um, CMS has become more strict with the max about accepting new omitted costs for bad debts and Medicaid eligible days, not previously adjusted in a revised NPR. Um, we have been instructed to limit subsequent reopenings to address only those items adjusted within the revised NPR. This relates to those um, cost reports that maybe were were filed more than three, settled more than three years of the original NPR, and so you're wanting to um, add omitted cost or bad debt, but um, the previous reopening didn't address those issues, and it's outside the three-year window. We cannot reopen uh, once that three-year window is closed. So um, you have to make sure you want to get all that in your original reopening request because you will not get time um, years later. If you have a reopening request for an issue that is in a jurisdictionally valid appeal, these are generally denied because these items must be addressed through the administrative resolution process, and those involve the Blue Cross Blue Shield Association and the Provider Review Board. If you've already filed an issue, within an appeal and the appeal is active, please do not request a separate reopening for the same issue. There are two separate audit staffs working on these and that can cause confusion and cause duplicate work. We're going to roll on into some appeal information here. If you um, do find that you need to file an appeal, those need to be filed within 180 days of your NPR and the, those should be sent to the association with a copy to Cahaba, and you may send your copy to CR Appeals at CahabaGBA.com or via mail at the address below. And all this information is on our website, so you can go there to get the uh, association address. I believe it's also in your NPR letter. Next, part of filing your cost report is getting your PSNR online information. And we've had some problems with that in the, the past, in the not so the distant past, as a matter of fact, just a few, few months ago, when we were filing the 1231. So as you're aware, this became live in February of 2009. It's used for all cost reports after 13109. And if you did have need of a cost report, that was filed before 13109, you would need to send um, that email to PSNR at cahabagba.com to request that legacy PSNR for those older cost reports. CMS uh, Publication 100-6, Chapter 8, Section 10.1 eliminated the requirement for Max to provide the PSNR unless the provider cannot access the system and informs the contractor of this issue. Please be aware if you wait until two days before the cost report is due, there's probably 30 other providers who have also done the same, and, and we may not be able to get it to you within before the cost report is due. So if you're aware of an issue, contact us sooner rather than later. 
um, it's extremely important that you have registered for the iAccess to access your PNR, PSNRs, and that you maintain your access. You have to go in there periodically to, to get that access. Otherwise, um, it, you'll get locked out. And there's more information on our website at the link provided. If you haven't already registered with IX, I've given the link for that, and um, you must establish access to the PSNR. If you have questions regarding your IX registration, we are we are not um, able to help you with those. So I've given you the help desk number and their email number, email address, and um, there are instructions for the PSNR. Um, on the, at the link below from CMS. So we're trying to give you as much information as possible to, to help you through this process. We suggest that you request your pay date is approximately 30 to 45 days prior to your cost report due date. So if you're about to file at 630, I hope you've already requested your PSNR. Um, and you must sign on at least every 60 days to avoid your user ID being revoked. Please be aware that the first person to register from your organization is designated as security official, and they can approve users but cannot access the PSNR. Chain providers must register each provider within the chain individually, and Cahava cannot provide either the provider's CMS ID or resend a password to the provider, nor identify the correct PTAN number. If you need a summary PSNR and you can't access um, the system, well, first, when you access the system, the PSNR will be sent to your inbox um, through the PSNR system. A summary um, can be accessed, uh, requested by, by Kahaba. You can't get into the website. We will also send out through our PSNR mailbox. If you request a PSNR through the mailbox, please be specific. Use your correct PTN number, your provider type, summary, detail. Uh, don't forget your subunit. Lots of times you'll you'll uh, forget that you need to get that SNF one. So go ahead and get all those. If you do need a detailed PSNR, those are burned to a CD and DVD and will be sent via mail. Uh, so please ensure if you're at requesting a detailed PSNR that we have your mailing address and the appropriate person to send that to. Once again, if you have consultants requesting a PSNR, we require a letter from the provider saying that we can release that information to the consultant. If you are asking for legacy reports, those take longer. IX is now archiving reports with claims that are five years or older. Therefore, if you wanted something from 2009, those would take um, longer at this point than a 2010 or 2011 cost report. Please do not email your favorite audit manager or um, auditor with those requests. Um, all those requests have to come through the PSNR mailbox, and we do work through those as quickly as possible. As noted, just be aware that, that if you're waiting to the end of the month, we may have a, a large group of providers requesting those. If you have questions, Related to the PSNR, that are not about IX registration or issues with IX, please feel free to email us at the PSNR at CahabaGBA.com. I want to go over the next thing that I want to talk about is bad debt issues. Bad debts are um, extremely important to providers. They're um, receiving these bad debts. They all everybody wants to receive the bad debts they're entitled to, especially as um, Legislation has gone in that reduces the amount of bad debts you're getting, so you want to make sure that doing what you need to do to receive those bad debts you're entitled to. The first thing you can do is make sure that your bad debt listing is acceptable. And if this could be in electronic format, even better, because um, we will be putting those, we will be looking at those, and if they're um, in electronic format, also prevents a lot of error. So. In order to ensure that you have everything you need on that bad debt, I've listed everything here, the name of the beneficiary, their HIC number, 
the date of the first bill, date of service, your Medicare payment date, amount of write-off, amount of the deductible and coinsurance. If they're indigent, the indigent designation. They have Medicaid payments or other provider payments or other um, self-payments. Those need to be recorded on there. If they are indigent and have Medicaid, we need the Medicaid number and we need the date of write-off. What we find is that um, in some cases, the, the provider for determining indigent um, is not meeting all of the requirements from CMS. So I've given you publication 15-1, section 312, which talks about indigent determination. And um, you want to make sure that you're following these guidelines when you're determining indigent. This is what we're finding a lot of problems with with providers, is, is they're not supporting that the um, beneficiary is indigent. So we want to make sure that you follow these guidelines and do this. Um, listed those out. The indigent has to be determined by the provider, not the patient. So just signing a declaration that I can't pay this as a beneficiary is not proof of indigent. You should take into account the patient's total resources um, with an analysis of assets, liabilities, income, and expenses. And you should not take into account, um, or you should take into account any extenuating circumstances that would affect the determination of that indigent. You must determine that no other source other than the patient would be legal or responsible, a local welfare agency or guardian, and the patient's file should contain documentation of, by which the indigent was determined to back up and substantiate that determination. Once indigent is determined and the provider concludes that there's no improvement, in the beneficiary's financial condition, the bad debt may be uncollectible without applying the Section 310 procedures. One thing we're looking at, um, we, we've noticed here for some reason, um, I don't know if there's a group offering this or not, but um, there seems to be a trend where providers are trying to determine indigents based on zip codes, and that is not acceptable from CMS you still need to do a net worth. So even if they're in a zip code where 90% of the population is under the poverty level, you can't just assume that they are um, meeting indigents based on where they live. So you still have to do an analysis of net worth with that analysis of assets to liabilities, verifying the income. I've seen bank statements, copies of the SSI checks, um, and you want to make sure that, um, that the provider is looking at that and going through that. If you do have a deceased beneficiary and you're wanting to write off those uh, deductibles and coinsurance, you need to do an estate search. Uh, most of these can be done online or uh, documented. Um, so one thing that we're finding is that you want a written documentation of that search. So if you do call the probate court, Ask them if they have a form that you can complete to get that filled out by them or um, other information for the probate court. They have an online service. Hopefully there's something you can print off from there to show that you've checked with the probate court on those deceased beneficiaries. Some other issues we've found with the Medicare bad debts is receiving a significant amount of Medicare Advantage claims included in the bad debt listing. Please remember that bad debts relating to the HMO plans are reimbursed as part of the capitation rate um, established by the Medicare Advantage plan, and these are not included on your Medicare cost report. Uh, bad debts relating to deductibles and coinsurance for fee reimbursed services should also not be included on your provider's bad debt listing. Examples are outpatient therapy and ambulance services, the deductibles and coinsurance for these are not reimbursable by debt. We've noticed that the crossover listings do not have the HIC numbers on the listings. Even though you've put the Medicaid number, you need to put um, the beneficiary HIC numbers on there also. The 
the crossover bad debts are being claimed on a denied Medicaid remit. If the Medicaid is denied, you can't just claim that um, coinsurance and deductible. We have to know why it was denied. Is it that they don't pay for it? Is it that the claim was filed incorrectly? If the, file was, if the claim was filed incorrectly, it's not an allowable bad debt. Um, we've noticed collection efforts have not ceased as of the write-off date. There's not support uh, for billing of the beneficiary consistently for a minimum of 120 days. A lot of providers are saying that maybe the first bill is when they come into the office, well, or um, when they're leaving the hospital. Well, if insurance hasn't been filed, is that the first bill? Have you documented what you've given them? Have you estimated the insurance? So, so you want to make sure that the first bill is sent timely and within 45 to 60 days. The date of service puts a, a balancing act there to make sure you have the proper information on there. As you're aware, starting in 20, fiscal year 2013, legislation went through regarding a reduction of bad debts. Hospitals and non-dual beneficiaries in SNFs and swing beds Medicare bad debt reimbursement was reduced by 35%. ESRD began a three-year reduction with physical year 2013 by 12%, 2014 by 24%, and physical years thereafter by 35%. Other providers such as CAUSE, CMHCs, RHCs, FQHCs, cost-based HMOs, HCCP and CMPs and dual eligible beneficiaries of SNF and swing bed began our three year reduction of ad debt reimbursement with fiscal year 2013 12%, 2014 24%, and fiscal years thereafter 35%. And don't we love our acronyms here? We've got a lot. Before we get into the next session, I think we, it's a good time to do the next polling question. So I'll turn it over to Martha to do the next polling question. Okay, the next um, question is how many days um, must you collect on bad debts? Uh, first response is 60, second 90, 120, 180, or uh, you don't know or it doesn't apply to me. Again, um, if you're wanting CPE credit, please answer the question, whether it's right or wrong, uh, and then we will um, uh, <clears throat> and also have to be on 90% on of the time. And we'll leave this question open just a few seconds more. Got about um, two seconds left on this one, and we're going to close this poll um, and share the results. And the answer most uh, received is, is the 120. And Debbie, we do have a question that's come up on that. Is the 120-day billing a minimum? Is it a rule uh, per CMS or just a guideline? The 120 days is the minimum rule by CMS to bill. So um, the only exception would be for indigent, document, documented indigent patients. You would not have to bill for the 120 days if indigence has been already determined. But if you're in the process, I would continue to bill them for those just to, to cover yourself. But it is required to bill for a minimum of 120 days. Yeah. Um, I didn't note in here, but, but please remember that all provider type, Medicare, self-pay, um, private pay, insurance, any of those, you have to can handle your bad debts and your write-offs consistently and the same for all provider types and payer types. So you want to make sure that um, all your payer types are being handled the same way. So if you're billing for 180 days for all of your other accounts, then for Medicare, you have to bill for 180 days. Does that answer the question? 
I think that does. We have uh, one other question. Um, the SNF has dual eligible, uh, but SNF not Medicaid certified. Would this be claimed as indigent since they are dual eligible? If not, how can a SNF file a claim? I'm not sure how they would do that. I would think, I think we've disallowed those in the past. So, um, a, a lot of times I think it depends upon the state and whether or not you can work with the state in order to allow them to, to bill um, with that. But I know several years ago there was the issue of the fact that it had to be billed to the state and a lot of the nursing homes had to go back to their state and ask them how they could implement that. Yeah, because we, there is a rule that you must bill for um, those secondary payers. Even if you know that they're not going to pay anything, you must bill. So I'm not sure how that works, not being um, set up with them. So yes, I would go back to your state agency because I think, you know, we would we would probably tend to disallow those if you weren't. Uh, sending the bill. You know, if you send the bill and it's, you know, denied because it's SNF or, or whatever, however that works, then then we would probably allow it. But there is a mess bills policy from CMS that requires providers to bill for uh, that secondary insurance. Okay, yeah. I think that's I think that's all that we have right now. Okay, I'm not sure how many. Um, providers we have on the line that uh, might be cost reimbursed or um, maybe have units, subunits that are cost reimbursed or areas with pass-through pass costs, but I wanted to go over a few um, areas about reasonable cost. Get my slide to go. So what we're seeing is all providers are required to properly report your costs on the Medicare cost report. Of course, call providers being cost reimbursed are focused on more often um, because it does have a direct dollar effect. But you should remember that um, all of the cost report instructions in the reimbursement manual 15-1 are applicable to your cost reports even though we are on PPS now for most providers. You still have to file that cost report uh, following the guidelines in the manual. So one thing we're seeing is that there are advertising costs being overstated. Um, advertising is not allowable to promote your um, facility. It's only allowable, it's supposed to just make people aware of the services, but you can't try to increase your utilization with your advertising. Um, this used to be a big thing. You used to have to keep copies of the ads that you would put in and put out there and, and big billboards generally, you know, um, were not allowed and are not allowed. So so please be aware of, of that if you're claiming advertising costs. If you have questions, you can contact us about whether those type of costs are allowable and um, we can help you with those. Um, any costs that are claimed must be reasonable, necessary, and what a prudent buyer would expect to pay. All your step-down allocations should follow the instructions. And if you're directly assigning costs, um, you must do it for all cost centers. You can't just directly assign um, certain areas and, and then put everything else into a general service area. You have to be able to directly assign, say, employee benefits to each department. You can't just selectively uh, directly assign some of those and then put the rest into an employee benefits area. Um, we're seeing where providers are combining your revenues it producing cost centers. For example, each therapy needs a separate cost center and a separate A83 on the cost report. So you want to make sure that you're, that you're completing that appropriately. An issue that we've found particularly with um, our um, calls are the ER standby costs per CMS um, 42 CFR 415.60. You must have an annual allocation agreement that proportions the percentage of time uh, for each category of services 
stock position. I've listed those here. Um, you missed the activities, this position not paid by Part A or Part B, such as research. And the allocation must be supported by documentation of time spent in each category and the information of that um, documentation has to be auditable by the intermediary or contractor. That's where we're finding the, the lack there is that there is not enough documentation to support the time spent in the category. Um, you can maintain time studies in accordance with the CMS instructions. You can contact your um, contractor or to, to get help with setting up those time studies if you need or getting pre-approval of the weeks you're going to use can be a good idea. Um, to claim an unmet guarantee, your ER physician revenue must be available based on the billing as compared to the compensation guaranteed by the provider and the difference must be reasonable to be allowable. ER contracts must be maintained on all ER physicians and the physician time must be maintained. We've even had where the ER contracts were not able to be, be located. So please document this cost. It's a big cost and, and we want you to get what you're entitled to. Um, we're seeing that you're paying ER physician groups based on contracts written for 24 hours a day and um, these ER physicians are at the facility a portion of that time seeing patients. And CMS only intended to pay for actual standby time as they realized that in a rural facility the doctors may be idle and they recognize that doctors are only able to bill professional services for a portion of their time. For a call, the physician can be on standby but not on hospital premises if they can be on site within 30 minutes. Medicare only pars, pays under Part A for actual standby cost. Therefore, the time the physicians are seeing patients, professional services should be documented within time studies or other allocation methods. Professional time is not removed from the standby cost. Medicare is reimbursing for that standby at the same time as doctors are seeing patients and billing patients, so they could be getting um, they're getting double reimbursed. Not sure how many PIP providers we have on the phone, but we have had some issues with rack adjustments in the PIP providers. Um, the bi-weekly PIP amount is paid um, at the established rate regardless of any Part A claim activity. Uh, Part A claim activity for services paid under PIP is reflected on remittances. And um, the information on how those are calculated is listed here. One thing to note is that we have had um, some holds on this because when they're going into the PSNR, they are not processing into the PSNR system in all cases correctly. Some cases they are, some cases they are not. So we are, we're holding up on some of these to um, try to look and, and work through and make sure that we have the most up-to-date information and, and CMS is working to make sure that the PSNR is correct on these. Um, these began this last year. Um, it'll continue to impact your calculated reimbursement amount for PIP, PIP claims, but the bi-weekly PIP amount will continue at the established rate. So if you have a problem with your PIP, um, I think you, you've got our, our contact information. You've probably already been contacting us and, and we'll work through those. But as stated right now, we're holding on some of those cost reports uh, because we're holding on to make sure that the PSNR is properly stated for those rack adjustments. Um, calculation of the PIP payments, uh, total bi-weekly PIP, plus or minus any rack adjustments that affect the payments for the PSNR. And the rack adjustment amount is included on the PSNR in the field labeled actual claim payments for PIP. Um, and that field includes the total of operating outlier payments and plus or minus rack adjustments. Now, that may be the field they're having trouble with. Um, after the cost report is settled, once these are, are applying correctly, the, the adjustments and reversals should continue to impact the payments on individual remittances. Um, so the PPS providers, there should not appear to be a material difference in the final reimbursement for those claims. Um, if they were if they were adjusted through the cost report. 
and um, until we were told to, to hold on these for CMS, we would not normally just hold settlement uh, for the rack adjustment. So um, if there are material differences, if you were settled, um, you can request a reopening um, if it's material difference. As you're aware, I'm sure that a lot of you have received requests for 2016 wage index and OMS, which started earlier this year than normal than we have in the past. Um, and it is a full year of OMS this year. So um, I think 95% of our providers completed their OMS survey, and I, I appreciate that. Um, we, we worked through those, and we started our um, Review. The PUF file was put out there in July. Um, they have released the timetable and it is available on our website. Um, during October was your time to request your revision. And once that time ended, we went out and started doing our wage index reviews. If you are getting wage index requests or OMS requests, please. Um, turn those around as quickly as possible to those auditors because even though we started earlier, we really don't have any more time. CMS still expects us to send our PUF file by mid-December, um, so we still have to complete these by mid-December. The good news is we're getting them done before the holidays uh, for the first piece of it, and that's good for all providers and, um, and the, the MAC so that maybe we can not have to worry about these requests um, during the holidays. We currently are um, just finished all the processing, um, the majority of processing for the 2010 and 2011 SSI settlements that were previously on hold. Um, we have not been given the go ahead yet to, to release the 2012 settlement and therefore um, but we anticipate that any time now. So, so um, some of those had the, depending on what your year in were, we already have the SSI percentage available. So we have been processing um, those in the your final adjustment report. You have seen the up, most up to date um, SSI ratio we have. And that brings us to any questions or concerns that I can help you with. Oh, actually, we need to do our last polling question, I believe. I'm going to ask this question that we've got, and then I'll launch the polling question that we have. Um, this one related relates to the 12 month settlement uh, after acceptance. If you've not, if you have not received an NPR, uh, may a provider um, send in an appeal for any adjustment, including Dish? Right now, we we are on an 18 months um, for our 1231 12 cost reports and probably our 630 13 cost reports. You can request an not an appeal. But you can request to amend. If we have not started that cost report, we may we we will probably still consider that. But if we have finished the desk review or are deep into the desk review we may not um, be able to process the amended and you will have to wait to appeal the issue in, until you receive your NPR. So, um, you know, we cannot, appeals are, are completed, have to be filed after an NPR is issued. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and launch the, launch the last polling question, but we do have a couple other questions and we may, uh, uh, we'll need to get to those as well. The last polling question, um, if I can get it, the right buttons uh, clicked here, is Medicare Advantage bed debts can be claimed on the cost report, true or false? And we'll need to, to leave that open for just a, um, a few, few seconds here.
and we've got um, about 90% of the folks that have voted. So if you haven't voted, then do so within the next uh, um, three or four seconds so we can close that and get to the rest of the, the questions. Um, there, I'm going to um, close this poll, share the results. 95% uh, said uh, false and 5% said true. It is false. It is false. Um, the other question that we have, um, Debbie, is a PSNR um, issue regarding hospitals in the bundled service demonstration models. Has Cahaba received any guidance from CMS when this will be resolved since our 2013 cross reports has not yet been filed? I am not aware of anything on that. If they would like to email me the specifics um, to descott at cahabagba.com, I can check with our um, manager who works on the TS in our work group and, and see what he knows about that. Okay. And then um, a couple of RHC questions. Um, in an RHC, which transportation costs are allowable and what is not allowable? You are not supposed to pay to transport patients in an RHC. So I wouldn't generally um, expect to see transportation of patients in an RHC. Um, there may be costs related to a provider um, going between the clinic and a, a SNF. So those costs may be reported as transportation. And um, But please be aware they should be reasonable. And we have seen instances of um, people put in the cost of the, the physicians, Mercedes or Infinity on the cost report and um, not documenting actual mileage driven or, or usage and, and that is not allowable. So um, transporting patients, um, I'm, I'm not aware of anything that allows the transportation of patients uh, to be paid for by the, the RHC. Okay, um, the next question uh, relates um, to an RHC possibly as well. Now that the CDC recommends both the Prevar 13 and the Prevar 23 for some Medicare patients, are those allowable for RHCs? I think what I've been reading is that those are going, um, CMS is still looking at how they're going to pay for those outside the RHC, so in a Part B setting. Um, you can claim them, I believe, in a limited amount on your cost report, I think. And I, I'm not a clinical person, so um, I apologize. But I think one of them is recommended like every five years. And so you could you could put it on there. It's going to go into your average cost, though. So, you know, if you have five of these and they're $100 each and, you're, you know, you have a 1,000 other flu shots that are $40 each, then obviously the average is going to come down and you're not really going to get reimbursed your full amount for those. So um, so right now I believe that you can claim those, but, but like I said, it, uh, my understanding is not every patient is going to receive those um, and, and your total patients are reported on the cost report, so it will be diluted if those are a much more expensive vaccine. Okay. Um, and then um, I think that's pretty much all um, you did have. Renee Rohn is, is on the call and she did offer up the answer on the appeal issue with the 12 months and said that they can appeal, but she believes the CMS um, made or the, will dismiss it if the MAC can show that CMS had delayed the issuance of the NPR. So that is an item there. Okay. And that, that's all the questions that we have at this time. And if there uh, are no other questions that we have, um, there was some housekeeping items uh, regarding CPE certificates. Those CPE certificates will be emailed to you and it will be emailed um, normally around the, the end of November. It takes us a little time to process our responses and results. And uh, so with 
with this. Um, Debbie, I'd like to thank you for sharing the information for the cost reporting with us today. Um, and the participants, I thank you for attending uh, this session. You should be receiving an evaluation for the session. Um, and if you feel free to comment on other se seminar topics that you would like to hear. Uh, we continue to have Tennessee HFMA has a, a Tennessee Trains on Tuesdays. That's the second Tuesday of every month. Our next um, topic will be um, Tuesday, December the 9th. It's EHR audits, uh, opportunities, and roadmaps. And you can find out more information on that on the Tennessee um, HFMA website, which is tnhfma.org. And so with that, Debbie, again, thank you very much for uh, doing the session for us today. And uh, the attendees, thank you for coming. Thank you.